Hey, this is Presh Talwalker reminding you to mind your decisions. For thousands of years, mathematicians have been fascinated by the ratio of a circle's circumference C to its diameter D. The ancient calculation of this ratio comes from famous mathematicians whose names should be known to everyone. This includes Archimedes in Greece, who estimated 3.14, Aryabhat in India, who estimated 3.1416, and Li Hui in China, who estimated 3.14159. This was a world record calculation not surpassed for another 1,200 years. Now what you might find curious is that these papers do not use the modern-day symbol of pi as we know it to represent this ratio. This is actually a very recent use of the symbol pi. It started in 1706 with William Jones, and it spread throughout Europe and the rest of the world only in the last 300 years. Another interesting thing is that while the ancient mathematicians suspected that pi was a never-ending decimal that didn't repeat, they didn't know it for sure. The first rigorous proof came in 1761 from Lambert, who demonstrated once and for all that pi is irrational it cannot be represented as the ratio of two positive whole numbers. Why did it take so long for this proof? Well, here's a quote from a textbook when I was taking an honors math class at Stanford. Let me summarize this quote. It essentially says that it is not easy to prove that pi is irrational. In fact, there's another sentiment in another textbook I took while I was taking a math class at Stanford. Again, the textbook states that it is not simple to prove that pi is irrational. So in this video, we're going to attempt this very task. We are going to rely on a 1947 paper by the number theorist Ivan Nevin, a simple proof that pi is irrational. But how can it be simple? We're going to take a little detour to Hemingway. Here's a quote. A few things I have found to be true. If you leave out important things or events that you know about, the story is strengthened. Consider the six word story, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. This is an example of iceberg theory. The words to a story are like the visible 10% of an iceberg. The reader has to infer the underlying meaning, which strengthens the emotional response to the story. Who exactly is selling the shoes? Why are they selling baby shoes? How come they're never worn? Once you start to think about these details, the tragedy is made much stronger than if the author were to tell you the details. The same sort of idea occurs in mathematics. Niven's proof is just one page long but each sentence is like the tip of an iceberg. The proof uses only high school level calculus, but it demands the reader to work to understand its meaning. This is very common in mathematics where textbooks have cliches like the proof is left to the reader. So now let's try and tackle this proof. Here's a very high level outline of what the proof entails. It's a proof by contradiction. First, we assume that pi is rational. We then define a function based on the fraction that pi would be. We then establish properties of the function. And eventually, we discover such a function has contradictory properties, which then implies pi has to be irrational. Now, just to go in a little more detail, first, Niven defines a family of functions f of x as follows. He then establishes one property that this integral will always be an integer. Then he establishes that this integral is actually wedged between zero and this ratio, which will tend to zero as n goes to infinity. So what does this mean? Well, property two shows the integral will be between zero and one for n sufficiently large. And that contradicts property one, that the integral always has to be an integer. And that will be the contradiction that then leads to the conclusion, pi is irrational. So let's go over a little more detail. We first assume that pi is equal to a over b for positive integers. We then define 
a family of functions depending on a positive integer n as follows. f of x is equal to x to the power of n multiplied by a minus bx all raised to the power of n all over n factorial. Now we first need to show property 1, that the integral from 0 to pi of f of x times sine of x will always be an integer. I feel this is the hardest part of the proof, so bear with me. The first thing you're going to have to do is define another function which is fairly complicated. g of x is equal to f of x minus the second derivative plus the fourth derivative and so on in the alternating sum of even numbered derivatives all the way up to f of 2n. Now what's the point of defining this function? Well first we're going to show that f of x and its derivatives have integer values at x is equal to 0. This is an iceberg step. In Niven's proof, there's not much justification and you have to work out the details. I'm going to present it much like Niven's proof. The idea is to notice that n factorial times f of x is a polynomial with integer coefficients and its terms in x range in degree between n and 2n. At x is equal to 0, the terms with x will vanish and terms without x will work out to integer values due to the binomial theorem and the power rule of derivatives. Now there's a lot going on in this step, but I'm sure you'll be able to work out the details and it'll be much more satisfying if you do so. The complementary part of this step is that this result is also true at x is equal to pi, which equals a over b. To see that, verify that f of x is equal to f of a over b minus x. You can then verify that f of x and all of its derivatives will have integer values at x is equal to pi. So what does this get us? We'll now calculate the derivative of this function. We'll calculate the derivative of g prime of x times sine of x minus g of x times cosine of x. It's not too complicated to do this, and the result you get is the second derivative of g multiplied by sine of x plus g of x times sine of x. This simplifies to be f of x times sine of x. So we've now calculated one antiderivative of f of x times sine x. So now let's take the integral of f of x times sine x from 0 to pi. We can then evaluate its antiderivative from 0 to pi, and this simplifies to be g of pi plus g of 0. Now, we know this integral always has to be an integer by step 1, so we've established property 1. We now need to establish property 2, which is this inequality, and show that the right-hand side goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. We'll work on this one step at a time. First, let's show that 0 is less than f of x times sine of x in the interval between 0 and pi. We do this in two steps. In this interval, first notice that sine is a positive function, and second, you have to reason that f of x is a positive function too. It's not too complicated to do that. The product of two positive functions is positive, so that establishes the left-hand side of this inequality. For the right-hand side, we notice the following things. First, in this interval, sine of x is less than or equal to 1, and second, we'll be able to reason that f of x is less than pi to the power of n times a to the power of n all over n factorial. It's not too complicated to show that. When you multiply these two inequalities together, you get the right-hand side. We'll now integrate each term from 0 to pi. Let's evaluate each of these integrals. The left-hand side integral is 0, and the right-hand side integral will be pi to the power of n plus 1 multiplied by a to the power of n all over n factorial. We now need to establish that the right-hand side inequality goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So we'll consider pi times e to the power of pi a. The Taylor series of this will be the following expansion, where each term is pi to the power of n plus 1 multiplied by a to the n all over n factorial. Since pi times e to the power of pi a is a convergent series, the terms must tend towards 0. 
This implies the right-hand side will go to zero as n goes to infinity. So we've now established property one and property two. So let's put these two together. Property two states the integral will be between zero and one for n sufficiently large, and this contradicts property one that the integral is always an integer. We therefore can conclude our original premise was wrong, which means pi has to be irrational. Congratulations, you've just learned the proof for one of the most famous results in mathematics. Thanks for watching. These math videos, which can be watched for free on YouTube, build confidence for students and inspire mathematical discovery for viewers around the world. They have over 100 million views and the channel has over 1 million subscribers. Please subscribe for free to get the newest videos and email me a puzzle or math topic, presh at mindyourdecisions.com. If you so choose, you can check out my merchandise on Teespring, you can check out my books listed in the video description, and you can support me on Patreon. Thanks for watching and thanks for your support.